Welcome um, to the fifth annual Green Space Gathering put on by the Parks Commission for the City of Portland. And um, thank you for coming in on such a glorious night. I had like 20 minutes to take my dogs for a quick walk and we got around the corner to head back home and they put the brakes on like, no, because it's so beautiful out. So thank you for coming in and being here tonight. Um, Parks Commission uh, is a city appointed body that uh, hears citizen input and works really closely to make recommendations to the Department of Public Services and City Council. Um, we typically meet the first Thursday of each month um, at the Department of Public Services on Portland Street and there's information about that online. Um, we're really excited about the lineup tonight. I think we've got an informative and inspirational evening here for you tonight and I hope that you're going to enjoy that. Um, I'd like to take a moment and just recognize, if you're not already familiar with who our um, commissioners are, if I can call your name and have you stand up as your um, name is announced. Jeff Scher is here, or is helping out with all our AT stuff. Uh, Dory Waxman, who just arrived. Jamie Parker, <laughs> caught you in the back. Um, we also have, Car is Carol Hutchins here? No. I haven't seen her face. I know Steve Morgenstein, uh, is not able to be here tonight, and Travis Wagner is not here tonight. Michael Murtaugh is one of our newest uh, commissioners, and um, I fucked out. I think I got everybody. Um, so feel free to talk with Ralph. I just wanted to see if you were paying attention. How could I forget Ralph? Ralph Carmona. Um, everybody knows Ralph. Um, and at this time, Cynthia. Lobenstein. I said Jamie. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so we're going to go through the evening's uh, agenda. We've got uh, Wolf Tone here from the Trust for Public Land with some uh, really interesting information about the assessment that's being put forward in the survey regarding our parks. Uh, we also are very grateful to have Liz Visa here from uh, Executive Director from Boston Carmen. And uh, at the end of the evening, if people want to stay around we'll, at around 7.30, we'll have a very informal 15-minute um, question and answer period. And uh, we're going to start off with uh, Director of Public Services um, and the Department of Public Services giving a brief overview of what's going on um, in the world of our open spaces. And with that, I'd like to call up uh, Troy Moon, who's the uh, Environmental uh, Programs and Open Space Manager. Troy, thank you. Thank you, Diane, and thank you everybody for coming tonight. We have a really great program, as Diane mentioned. I really want to appreciate all of our um, partners who brought tables today to, to provide information about um, some of the programs you guys are offering. So it's really, really happy to see you here. And before we get started, I also want to introduce some city staff members, and we can introduce Parks Commission members. So we have Joe Dume back here, who is our Parks and Cemeteries Coordinator. Um, we have Rick Noland um, from our planning department. I saw Rick come in. Here's Rick. Um, Jeff Tarling is here as well. And uh, I also want to, and Sally DeLuca. Sally is here from the recreation department. Hey, Sally. And I want to thank Sheila Hill Christian, our acting city manager, for joining us tonight. Um, so before I get, before we get to start, I want to introduce Mike Wobinski. Oh, who else am I missing? Am I missing? Oh, Councilor Lehman. She's all not city staff, elected officials. We're, all, we're also very pleased to have elected officials. And Melissa Grafham, who we also want to appreciate for a lot of the background she did today. She got us organized and got everything set up. So thank you, Melissa. And I also want to acknowledge CTN. You notice we have a camera person back here. So if you want to uh, check this out or, or if you enjoy the program and want to um, have some of your friends or neighbors watch it, you'll be airing on CTN. Um, so you can check it out later. So without further ado, I want to introduce Mike Bobinski. Well, I too want to welcome you uh, to our uh, Green Space Gathering event tonight. Um, as, as we were preparing for this event, I was kind of reflecting on the, the number of years that we've been, we've been doing this, and I think the, the, the strength of the Parks Commission when, we, when, when the City Council established it, that, that the, the, the inclusion of all of the, the major friends organizations in the city uh, is an opportunity to come together, an event like tonight, um, to not only talk about 
um, park projects and open space, but certainly uh, talk about some future things and, and some aspects of uh, how we manage uh, open spaces and parks in the city of Portland and maybe some ideas about, about the future. And from the city's, uh, or from our department's perspective, certainly Troy and, and Jeff and Joe Dume and myself, we greatly appreciate the work of the volunteers um, for their commitment and their time uh, in meetings and in, in follow-up events and activities. They've helped us in, in lots of different ways and recommendations, and we really appreciate that, that uh, commitment and that time. Um, a couple of just quick things that I wanted to mention uh, with regard to the past year and, and the year ahead in terms of some key projects that, that we're very proud of and, and we're greatly appreciative of, of the partnering that occurred uh, in some of these projects. The first one that, that I want to mention, is, of course, is the Fort Allen Park Project, the, the recent rededication of the park improvements. It's an example of a, a very strong partnership with the Friends of Eastern Prom, some private funds, and certainly a strong commitment by our city council in making um, reinvestments of, of the park to bring it back to uh, its glory days and improvements. And if anybody has had a, if you haven't had a chance to see that and go out there, I'd highly recommend that you visit that. Um, it, it was a tremendous uh, experience, I think, for uh, both our staff, our contractors, and, and certainly the Friends organization. Uh, Diane Davison leading the way, literally uh, taking photos and, and guiding uh, certain events and so forth. It was a significant project that, uh, that we will uh, have in our memory in terms of going forward. Um, we also have a couple of projects that are in stage and development. Uh, the Deering Oaks Pond projects, you've heard a little bit about that, I think, in the recent media. Uh, but it's a project that involves re reusing or re um, rethinking how we manage the pond itself from a water quality perspective. And uh, it's uh, associated with an EPA STAG grant that we got a few years ago. It's a local match by the, by the city through our CIP. And the intention with the project is to basically remove material on the bottom and provide a, a, a surface that actually allows uh, the city to improve its maintenance of the pond itself and uh, going forward uh, improve the water quality of that, uh, that water body. Some years ago we, we, correct, we corrected a sewer uh, overflow situation that had some impact on the pond and so now the water that uh, enters the pond is really just runoff and, and stormwater runoff uh, which certainly has um, some things that we're working on from a city's perspective um, in terms of uh, possible green uh, infrastructure applications that may fit in, into that pond as well. And, uh, our Transportation and Sustainability and Energy Committee of recent has asked us to take a look at some aspects of, of the pond project as well, so we're doing that. Our relationship with the land bank is significant, and, and not, not certainly just our department, but the, the changes that occurred through um, the Congress Square uh, initiative, uh, the changes with respect to um, the, uh, the park amendments as well that puts a, a role within the Parks Commission that we're still kind of working through with respect to their involvement on capital projects and changes to parks as well and their involvement in uh, endorsing those projects in collaboration certainly with the Parks Commission. So we're, we're going to be developing that uh, that relationship, we've been staff support to the land bank uh, for the last several years, and uh, they, they've been involved in some land acquisitions and currently are looking at um, a proposal that will be pr presented to the city council soon on acquiring uh, or helping to acquire the, the famous ice pond property on Peaks Island uh, in conjunction with the uh, Peaks Island Land Preserve uh, Organization. We have a strong relationship with community, uh, cultivating community, cultivating communities with respect to our public gardens. Uh, the department some years ago had a staff member that actually provided um, technical assistance with uh, managing our public gardens. We felt there was a, probably a better way to um, address our needs, our growing needs of public gardens in the city. Uh, we established a working relationship, a contractual relationship with cultivating communities who help us manage our public gardens and are continuing to uh, partner with us on some other uh, uh, opportunities for education and the possibility of another community garden, I think, Troy, in maybe the eastern uh, prom area behind the tennis courts, and that's a proposal that's, that's being developed at this point. 
Evergreen Cemetery uh, Phase Two. Joe Dume is here and can talk further about that. But a long-standing project that really will allow us to continue the, the use of Evergreen, our historic cemetery, and accommodate families and relatives of families into the future. We're currently almost at capacity uh, at the existing uh, Evergreen Cemetery anyway. Uh, the construction of, of this new phase, uh, which is essentially right off Stevens Avenue in that part of the city, will provide some 800, I think, to 900 burial spots and allow us to also move into cremation uh, uh, with a cremation niche design that will be um, responsive to, I think, what's happening in um, bereavement issues and family issues as well uh, in, in, in from the funeral perspective. So Joe Dume can talk a little bit more about that, but that's a significant project uh, that has been in the development stages, I think, for the last two years. A great partnership with the Friends of, of Evergreen and their assistance in reviewing design plans and, and development as well. Um, we also have a developing uh, orchard program, tree orchard program. Jeff Tarling and through um, his efforts uh, we're starting to uh, use some of our public garden space for uh, fruit trees uh, that can be introduced into our neighborhoods, into, into our communities as well, um, to provide uh, an alternative um, with respect to uh, our arboring programs and our, our tree programs as well. So lots going on. Um, uh, the department greatly appreciates the work of all of our volunteers. Um, we, we absolutely cannot function without you and, and without the, the work of our friends groups. Uh, I think we always try to strike that right balance uh, between sort of operations and the volunteer roles. I think in the future these kinds of relationships like we saw in the financial assistance that we saw with uh, the friends of Evergreen uh, and certainly the friends of Deering Oaks over the years will continue and, and we want to um, foster those types of relationships, particularly as we look at very costly, in some cases capital improvements, in other cases uh, advice on policies and, and directions of, of where we want to go with our open spaces and our, um, and our uh, park systems. I didn't mention the uh, Portland Trails, but the department has uh, a long-standing relationship with the Portland Trails organization on trail maintenance, trail development, um, looking at areas where uh, we can uh, partner and, and uh, get some advice, uh, particularly with respect to how we take care of our trails, dealing with security issues, dealing with uh, maintenance and, and those types of, of issues. So um, I think um, with that, I'll turn it back over, I think, Troy, uh, to, to you if there's anything you wanted to add. But I appreciate being a part of tonight and uh, look forward to listening to the speakers as well. Uh, and learn a few things uh, along the way. Thank you. Great, thank you, Mike. Um, and so sort of to begin our program, I know we've probably heard in the media and in, in conversations that the city is undertaking some work with the Trust for Public Land to, to inventory our open space and develop some recommendations on how we might move forward managing uh, our open spaces. Uh, so we're happy tonight to have Wolf Tone, uh, who is the main director of the Trust for Public Land, uh, to say a few words about where that project stands and what people can look to see in the near future. So Wolf. Um, hi everybody, my name is Wolf Tone and I'm the main state director for the Trust for Public Land and I'm really delighted to be here. Um, I've enjoyed the last year getting to know many of you. Um, and thank you Diane and to everybody on the commission for the invitation to be here. I'm going to be as brief as I can, give you an update on, um, as Troy has mentioned, uh, some work that's underway and it's not just the Trust for Public Land but it's the City of Portland and Portland Trails and the Trust for Public Land sort of flying at a level to put together um, a 21st century vision for the City of Portland and you'll recall I mean it's October and it was about a year ago November December some things really started to happen you started to have the Congress Square issue really really start to to um, be, a, be a little bit loud. You had um, Mayor Brennan put parks and open space in his February presentation. Um, you started to see the uh, Portland Trails engage with the Lerner Foundation about have a, how to have a civic dialogue on parks and open space and the role of those spaces in our community. And I was interfacing with a number of you about the future of how do we pay for our parks? How do we take care of our parks? It was all happening at the same time. 
And there was an awful lot of enthusiasm. There is still an awful lot of enthusiasm about creating um, a vision for what our parks take all that energy that is in each one of you and the communities around us and, and not only just sort of make noise, but really figure out how to move ahead. And, and by, by bringing this, this team back together, our ultimate outcome is to really put together a 21st century park system for a really cool city. And you, if you had the pleasure of seeing um, Adrian Benepe's presentation in June, you heard Adrian say, we've got a pretty good park system. Now, what do we want to do to make it really, really great? And that's, that's a little bit about what we're up to. <clears throat> So um, I, I kind of think of this as bringing the band back together. Uh, the city of Portland and Portland Trails and Trust for Public Land have had an awful lot of fun working together since the early 90s. And the first project with this nascent organization called Portland Trails um, was the purchase of the Eastern Prom from the rail yard. It took about two or three years, and, it, and it's a great story of creating one of the most beautiful parks on the, eastern, on the eastern seaboard. We got back together starting about 2006, 2008. Um, Rachel was a big part of this in creating the Bayside Trail, and took until about 2011 to bring that to fruition. But you can, it's not the best graphic in the world, but you can kind of see the trails start to creep, away, uh, creep around the peninsula. Kenko Woods in 2012, when the community uh, on Kenko Road and the community behind um, the uh, uh, Back Hove asked how can they protect those valuable 11 acres, and it's now a great place for tree forts and capture the flag and playing in the woods. So that's our work together, and, and this is the next, sort of the next chapter of what we're up to. The city of Portland early in the spring um, said to the Trust for Public Land, look, this is the kind of work that you guys do around the country. Can you help, can you help us deliver four, four or five things? Really understand what it is we want to accomplish with our parks. Get that population of, of ideas into one place. But not only how do we get those ideas into one place, what do we do with those ideas and how do we start to prioritize them? If we can get a sense of what we want to do, the next thing we need to also understand is how do we pay for it? Um, so if you've got your wish list and you have your budget ideas, you can start to prioritize. That's really the nutshell of, of, what, of where we're headed. And there are four steps um, that are starting to, really starting to unfold. I think when, um, um, when you heard that maybe I was going to come up and give a presentation about the status of this, of this planning, you were like, oh yeah, where is that? Or maybe you have no idea what we're up to. But um, a little bit of a reminder that this actually um, has been a very methodical process since, um, since the spring to put this in place. We thought maybe we'd come screaming out of the gates and have a plan, uh, have a process, and have it defined. But here we are in October, and it's really starting to pay off. I can't say enough about what we've been doing with the city and Portland Trails um, together to get a process in place that's going to make some sense. And we're right on the front end of, 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 um, of starting it up. And what is it? So one of the hardest parts I figured it would be would be to find people in Portland who care about parks. I thought that'd be the hard part. That hasn't been hard at all. Um, between all the, all the friends groups, the, everybody in this room, um, that is not going to be uh, the challenge whatsoever. What we are really interested in doing is looking at that population of information about how our, how, what are our parks, where are our parks, how are they being used. And Portland Trails is, um, in October, going to initiate a series of five neighborhood meetings, really bring it down to the local level and find out what people are doing and thinking and caring about in their local parks. Part of that conversation will be to blow it up into you know, a larger context, not just the neighborhood, but think about Portland in a, in a broader sense and, and how you use those recreation resources. I've had maps, paper maps, sort of dumped on my desk saying, these are the plans from the 1980s. We have the master plans. We have the capital improvement budget. We have um, green spaces, blue edges. All of this information is out there in people's minds and in their experiences, and what we want to do is begin to bring that information together through one-on-one -on -one interactions with the community. I'm, you'll see on this slide that there are sort of three tiers of, of participation. One I mentioned was the City of Portland, Portland Trails, and the Trust for Public Land, really trying to get our heads wrapped around this. The second are these community meetings, um, getting out there and having the conversations. And I'm going to loop back to this point in a second, but once we have all that information, what do we want to do with it? 
So the second step, um, and this is something that's a forte of the Trust for Public Land, is to take the power of visualization. Boy, did I get excited about this and had grand plans about all these really cool mapping tools that we could do and what other cities are doing. And the city and Portland Terrace is like, just calm down, just calm down. Keep it simple. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to show up with a base map. We're going to begin really simple visualization tools to see what we have here in the city, uh, where their parks are, what are the services that those parks offer, and what are the stories behind them. But do it in a visual sense. The third piece, um, if we can create that list, that big giant population of everything we want to do, and where our parks are and the improvements and how we want to use them, the Trust for Public Land also, um, we, we brought to bear some of our experts who can help us understand how can we pay for this? What are some of the creative tools that are out there, some of the obvious tools, the not so obvious tools, to be able to pay for parks and open space? What is legally possible? What is, uh, um, what are some of the bonding mechanisms? What are some of the, the, uh, the co-venture mechanisms? So if we can have a list of what we want to do, and we have a, a sense of our capacity to pay for it, we can go ahead and put a real action plan together. And this is what the city of Portland wants. They want to take those ideas and they want to prioritize them. And they want that to be a process by which we can look at a near-term um, set of priorities, a medium-term set of priorities, and what do we want to do over the long term. And really, instead of sort of being reactionary, be able to, to work through a, a system and say, these are the decisions we're making, and here's why, and here's how we got there. Um, so that's really what, what is unfolding um, now. So be on the lookout for these local community meetings that Portland Trails is going to lead through October, uh, starting the second half of October into December. We're going to pull that information in. We're going to um, sort of begin to break it down um, and, uh, and say this is, you know, create a picture of what you said, Portland. Does this make sense? And then begin to refine that down into that set of priorities uh, in the course of 2015. So that gives you a rough idea of, of what we're going to do. And um, it's going to start in October, and it's going to sort of unfold through the first half, maybe two-thirds of next year. Um, to come up with a set of priorities and a vision for Portland's parks. Uh, oh, one thing I almost forgot to mention um, as I look over this way is a really important part of this conversation is sort of the governance. And once we understand what we want to do, well, how are we going to take care of it? And you know, what are the different roles for uh, the land bank, for the Parks Commission, for the different uh, friends groups? and look at sort of that leadership structure. And that's a very complicated picture that we're all working to understand right now. So there's, no, there's nothing in place, but that will be part of the work. So if you have any questions, um, I'm, I'm available to, to, uh, to answer, either now or at the end. Great. So Certainly encourage everybody to keep an eye out for um, the dates of the public engagement um, meetings that Portland Trails will be doing. We'll be uh, distributing, distributing information about that via our website, and I'm sure we'll be doing press releases. So I really, really encourage everybody to take part in those. It's going to be really important work to hear what the community has to say about what sorts of things we want to see in our parks. So and as uh, Wolf mentioned, we will have some time at the end of uh, our program to have some questions and answers. We're doing really well in time so far, so that's good. Um, and so our keynote tonight um, is Liz Visa. She's the executive director of the Friends of the Boston Public Garden. And we thought that be a really, she would be a really compelling speaker for us tonight because we are you know, thinking about the roles of friends groups in our city and how do we engage with friends groups and what's a, what's a good relationship model um, between a municipal government and a friends group. And I think the Friends of the Boston Public Garden are a great example for us to look at. Um, we've had a lot of success um, and certainly if you've seen uh, the Boston Public Garden, um, it's, tremendous, uh, it's a tremendous place. Um, and Liz actually has an experience um, in, in Portland. Uh, she was engaged in some of the master planning efforts in the past uh, for Por Portland's parks, uh, for the Deering Oaks master plan, I think, the Evergreen Cemetery master plan, and uh, you know she is a, a landscape, ar landscape ar architect. So I think she's uh, got some, gonna have some good thoughts for us tonight, and I'm really, really happy to, to have her here. So Liz. shift in gears. 
As Troy said, it's wonderful to come back here. I uh, did work on, I was master, um, project manager for the Deering Oaks Master Plan in the mid 80s and then for the Evergreen Cemetery Master Plan in 91. So it's really a wonderful experience to be able to come back and see some old faces. Jeff is here and Anne and, and others. So as Troy said, um, I am the executive director of the Friends of the Public Garden and we work with the city uh, of Boston to care for what we say the first, uh, Boston's first public parks, the Boston Common, the Public Garden and Commonwealth Avenue Mall. And uh, we started in 1970. We were the first parks advocacy group in the region and one of the first in the country. I think Denver has it by a year, but it was um, a long time ago. And, and in those uh, ancient days, all of the city's parks were in pretty serious shape. So we'll take a look at that in a minute. But as you all recognize, because you're here and you're doing this good work, you realize how important public parks are to the livability of a city and to the joy that people have in the city and an ability to connect with one another in a green space. I mean, it brings out, I've talked to a lot of you before sitting down, you all use the word love and energy. I mean, there's something about parks that bring out the best of us. Um, there are places for us to be alone and to, to read a book. This is by the lagoon in the public garden. There are places to play and connect with our neighbors and our friends and our, our siblings. Um, this is the newest gar uh, public park that we have in Boston. It's uh, the Rose Kennedy Greenway. And we reclaimed, we claimed, we didn't have it before, but we claimed 15 new acres of land when we depressed the central artery and infamously had the big dig. It was a lot of pain in Boston, but it was worth it because this park has been an, our newest beloved space. And one of the things we've learned about, about public space from this one just coming online is that in the last six years, it's, been, it's a recent par park, and the property values around the Greenway have exploded in value. Now, we can't say it's all due to the Greenway, but those property values are now 700% higher than they were before the Greenway was built. I mean, it's this enormous impact. And if we studied a little more detail, we would see some other uh, contributing factors to that impact, but it's, it's no question that parks play a role on, in many levels in, uh, in, in health, climate change health, and, and economic health, and, and human health. And the same thing happened in our three parks. You're seeing an aerial with on the bottom is the uh, common in the garden, and then moving through the, uh, the central spine of the Back Bay neighborhood is the Commonwealth Avenue Mall. But they weren't always beautiful. They looked like this in 1970. And that garbage can is a makeshift garbage can in the garden. We had lovely uh, cars going through the garden. Everything was broken. In 1970, it was almost beyond repair. It's hard to think about that now when you go to the garden. Troy said it's a beautiful place. It is a beautiful place, and the common is, is not as beautiful because it's our problem child. It's an active park. It's very intensively used. And the mall, it, it looks wonderful. But in these days, it was in dire shape. Um, benches and light poles and, and pavement. In terms of the garden, the, this is a picture of the reconstruction of the fence around the garden. There was no fence along the Boylston Street side, and the other three sides had whole, huge holes punched in that fence. This is the Beacon Street side, and it's the, the um, fence is being rebuilt with funding both from the, uh, the city and from the friends in the uh, mid-70s. But things are pretty bad, and they're bad in, in a number of levels or challenging in a number of levels. And I show this picture to people in my demographic. They look kind of closely to see if they're in there. <laughs> Nervously. <laughs> because we had the hippie invasion, too. So we had this enormous social upheaval of the 60s and people heading for the suburbs and a recession and you know just the draining of energy and money for parks. Central Park was the same way. So. Uh, people gathered in a living room on Commonwealth Avenue and to wring their hands and think about what could be done. There were about 30 people who gathered and, and they said, well, we need to start an organization. We need, need to fight. So the, the beginning of any movement for, for reclaiming parks is a fighting movement. And as we mature, I think you will have all experienced it, although I've heard about some recent fights <laughs> because we can't stop fighting, but you do mature to becoming a partner in the true sense of the word. And how do we find that delicate balance between partnering with the city and advocating for our parks? But here, things were clear. These parks were abandoned, and it was an all-out uh, fight. But enter a more complicated, but in the end, a life-saving element which was a development that was proposed in 1970 Park Plaza. 
by um, a major development from uh, New York, Mort Zuckerman. There was a development proposal for uh, the blighted Park Square area along Boylston Street and the combat zone. This proposal included five to six towers up to 650 feet high, six million square feet of development, 2,000 car parking garage underneath the development. It was enormous and it had the support of everybody politically. It had the support of the papers and the developers certainly and the unions. They needed jobs. It was a recession time and the mayor and the governor um, and it had the opposition of the Friends of the Public Garden. <laughs> and others that were, were called fuddy-duddy tulip pickers back then because they thought we have the power, we have the idea, the city needs the economic development and this would give them economic development. This was before um, citizens uh, advisory committees, it was before environmental impact statements. None of these things were done. Now it is just a given that we need to have citizen participation. Sometimes it can be paralyzing. <laughs> if it's not done well, it can be very difficult because if it's not molded and guided well that the loud and sometimes not always constructive voices can have sway, but then it wasn't done at all. So um, the BRA, the Boston Redevelopment Authority, was finally forced to do shadow studies and to show what, what everybody feared, that shadows would go from Boylston Street completely across the public garden to Beacon Street. 75% of the garden would be shadowed in spring and fall, the growing season and the entire thing in the winter time, severe wind. I mean, it would have been absolutely destructive for the garden and for people's uh, enjoyment of the garden. So after many twists and turns and almost a decade long battle, it was defeated, but um, we learned some things from that defeat and from that fight. We learned that parks matter to people. People were very supportive. Many people of power were very supportive of this, of this design. But when people started getting a sense of what it meant to their beloved garden and common, they were ready to go down to the rails to make this thing stop. And um, those are things that the, the developer totally underestimated. And it was something also uh, unexpectedly gave the friends a platform. There had been a lot of fighting and jumping up and down about these parks, but the city just didn't listen until this fight, the, one of the classic David and Goliath fights, forced them to look because they had to listen to scores of people, more than the fuddy-duddy tulip pickers that cared about this place. And the friends gained power, which we need to flex when is necessary, and we continually have threats that we need to be flexing our muscles on. Um, we were capable of defeating a formidable foe. And uh, so people actually are afraid of us, you know, sort of the Wizard of Oz, but if, if somebody wants to do something, if a developer wants to do something in the neighborhood, they come and, and pay their respects to the Friends of the Public Garden. Um, Miles Mahoney was a powerful person in Sergeant, um, Governor Sargent's uh, administration, and he rejected the development, not because of what the Friends was saying, but for other reasons, and he was forced to quit. So it was a huge upheaval in the city. We also um, found, and this, this moment was a catalyst for all the parks in the city. People started waking up and looking around and realizing we're going to lose the fabric of our green space in the city if we don't do something about it. So it started a movement, a movement of parks um, restoration and parks reclaiming. And then going back to that original uh, slide showing the greenway and the economic development, the spur of economic development that can happen adjacent to a beautiful, well-kept park. Well, these developments are what was put in place after that huge monstrosity was defeated. They're appropriately scaled, well-sited, and they are luxury condominiums. And next door is the Four Seasons, and it costs a lot of money to stay there. And when you look at their promotional literature, what are they advertising? They're advertising their front door, which is the public garden. So what is our partnership model? As I said, we began fighting, and we realized after the fight ended and we defeated this foe that we had to become constructive. We had to become a 501c3. We needed to you know, put our money where our mouth was. And we didn't have a lot of money at that time, had very little money, but we had to build some kind of a treasury to join with the city and bring these parks back. This is a, just an, uh, 
picture of people enjoying the, the Commonwealth Avenue Mall. So our model, there are a number of models of, of, of friends groups. There's some that are purely advocacy. There are some, there's one in Lo, um, Los Angeles, which is almost like a foundation. They raise money to give to the city for them to do the work. Ours is in the middle, which is a partnership that provides expertise, funding and expertise to do the things that the city can't do that should be able to do and, and can't do. And at the end, I'll talk a little bit about networks and fighting for the cities getting more money. The, the city's giving more money to the Parks Department because right now, the Parks Department's budget is 0.7% of the city budget. It doesn't get enough money. It's gotten more capital money over the last several years, but not enough maintenance money. And our job is to educate the public about what it takes to care for these green spaces in an urban environment. So we first had to build the bones back. We had to put the fence back around the garden. We couldn't do anything in the interior until we protected it from cars and other damaging things. And then we had just to uh, raise money and work with the city on that to restore uh, some wonderful aspects of these parks, which is our, their fountains and their, and their sculpture. So when I think about bones, the things that we have focused on for the most part over these 40 years are the trees and the sculpture. And I'll talk a little bit about capital projects that we've expanded into because they are what make a park. Without the trees, we don't have a park. And the biggest threat of an urban tree is compaction. I mean, they're under siege all the time. And again, when you go out into a park, it looks so beautiful and calm and wonderful. <laughs> but those of you who know about green space know how these trees are, are fighting against, you know, no, not sufficient air, water, and nutrients getting to their root system because of compaction and other things that happen to them. So the other fight that animated us in the beginning was the fight against that development, but also the arrival of Dutch elm disease. And that did not recognize borders, so we took on the mall because it was adjacent to the garden because the Beatles didn't know that Arlington Street separated the garden from the mall. So all three of those parks had to be looked at as a system. The Commonwealth Avenue Mall, which has 638 trees on the nine blocks that we take care of, in the beginning, half of those trees were dead or dying because it was a monoculture of elms. And now we have replanted slowly but surely a combination of other trees that in, in form and aspect look similar to the elm or have that high canopy um, character that would be appropriate to that, to that place. But so we brought the city can take the trees down. They manage a lot of street trees, thousands of street trees. They just don't have the capacity and the funding to do the trees in these parks. So we plant trees through a, a sponsorship program. People fund the planting of a tree and they can have a plaque that recognizes somebody that they're planting that tree in honor of. And we tell them what kind of tree we're gonna plant and where it's gonna be, but they, they will buy into that program. And it's allowed us to, to replant them all, plant the garden, and, and do planting in the common, and we do a bench program as well. Because we have big old trees. I mean, when people have come from the Midwest, we've brought somebody that was an elm expert from Minneapolis. He came and he said, wow, you have big elms. So it turns out that some of the elms in the common by the Shaw Memorial close to the, the State House are the largest elms in the Western Hemisphere. And they need a lot of care. So in the beginning, in 1971, we spent $500 and we wrung our hands over, if we should, should we put that money into the park? We're just fighting for the park to save, uh, to take out two dying elms. And this last year, in our budget, was a half a million dollars for tree care. So as I said, uh, Dutch elm disease and caring for, we have lost elms in most of the rest of Boston, so we have, the elm collection we have in Boston is in these parks because of the work we've done. And this is somebody injecting with a fungicide, one of the elms on the mall. This shows you when you pull back the bark and seeing the streaking of the limb that that tree is infected with Dutch elm disease. And we have a, an arbor soil scientist whose wife is an entomologist, a bug person, and they've been getting really smart about watching the elm bark beetle and, and, and monitoring its activity. So they're putting these traps up in our parks to see when and where and how many bark beetles are present. And then we can time our treatments to be more focused on the time and the place and the intensity that those bark beetles are around. Um, pruning, a lot of pruning gets done. And then 
the soil. As I said, these trees are stressed in this urban environment, so we are now moving into the, the realm of soil care because you cannot just deal with the tree, you've got to deal with the environment in which the tree lives. So in several of the mall blocks, we've taken an entire block. This one is one that used to be part of the road and the road was reconfigured, so had terrible drainage, so we did some trenching and adding um, good uh, draining soil and did a whole redo of the irrigation system. So that for that one block on the mall, it was a $50,000 project. So fast forward from paying $500, we have, we're, we're investing a lot more money in the parks. Last year it was over a million dollars in the parks and that was just work in the parks. Um, we get funding and this in particular, um, we have a wonderful board and my chair of the mall committee, she wrote hand lettered 500 letters to neighbors asking for money to support this project. She got close to 100 people contributing and we also got grant funding. But um, talking to your neighbors, I think I talked to people from Lincoln Park, you just, you're new, but everyone you talk to loves this park. I mean, build on that love and say, it costs money to keep this love alive. <laughs> so you always have to make those connections and I, I know that you know that doing the work that you do. For years we advocated for having sculpture conservation inside the parks department because we felt that that's where it belonged. We have 44 pieces of public art in these parks. Some of them are some of the best pieces of art in the 19th century sculpture in the country, um, Augustus St. Gaudens, Shaw Memorial across from the State House, a fabulous piece of art. And they were not taking care of these, these pieces of art. This is what it looks like before it gets taken care of. If a monument is, is maintained annually, it can be about a $500 prospect. If you let it go, it could be up to $25,000 per piece. So six years ago, we saw the handwriting on the wall. It wasn't, it wasn't going to happen. They just weren't going to be able to get the funding and the uh, staff resources internally. So we began the project of um, taking on the regular care of, of all the monuments in the park. And we hired the former director of the Art Commission. So that's what's great about that is that she understands the city, she understands the politics, and she understands the art. So it's just, so we have, I would say, one of the best relationships in the city. We have lots of friends groups now. Um, I would say that we, ours is one of the most constructive and it's still complicated because it is a marriage, because the rules are sort of written and sort of not written, and because again, walking that line between partnering and advocacy, holding feet to the fire, is complicated and, and it's so one of, some of us talked about a dance, you know, and, and you just, you're ad libbing sometimes and you're building on what you've learned from what you've done before. So this is just showing you this transformation of William Lloyd Garrison. There's also graffiti. The Shaw Memorial was, um, somebody threw paint on it two summers ago, a woman who, who was mentally unstable. And the National Park Service does tours and they go to this as their, the first stop on their tour. The man who's the new uh, superintendent of National Park Service in Boston didn't know about us. So he called the city when this happened. They had their graffiti busters go out and they actually started to damage the bronze. And then they stopped, realized it, found out about the friends and we called this man in who's been doing the work on this monument for 42 years. And then you need to let people know that you're doing the work that you're doing. It's invisible. I mean, unless you're doing a capital project, and there's so much that's gone on to Deering Oaks ever since we did that master plan, I'm just as hard stopping. But a lot of the stuff, if you're doing tree care, it's hard to see that. So we, and for a while we were feeling a little um, tenuous about that, like, well, would the city feel like we were trying to gain the spotlight, and maybe we should just be there, our silent partner and not say anything. But finally they said, you need to toot your horn more because we're not going to get funding unless we do it. So we're starting to tell people, this is what it costs to take care of the elms. This is what it costs to have this guy go out and take the graffiti off. And we're putting signs. And I don't have a picture of this. We have a new program that, that with a new logo and, and it's just saying friends at work, just being really simple. Uh, this is what we're doing. There's one volunteer group we have, which is called the Rose Brigade, and they take care of the rose beds in the, in the garden. They started 26 years ago in the dark of night because, again, there was this feeling from the Parks Department, and we still have to deal with the reality of unions and where can we use volunteers. I don't know what, what the status of it in, in Portland is, but when people say, I'd love to help, it's always code for I want to get my hands dirty and get in the park and do something. <laughs> And in some parks, in the emerald necklace, in the woodlands, you can pull invasive species for years and you'll never get them under control. And you don't have to be skilled. In a place like the public garden and the common in the mall, there are specimen trees over lawn 
and, and sculpture. So what can we do here that can get people in here and get them connected to the park and caring about it and connected to us? This was one place. So for about four years, the, the um, Rose Brigade showed up after the parks crew left and they took care of the roses and then they left and they all looked good. So at some point they came up out of the dark and said, we are the ones. They have slowly gotten accepted by the parks department. Actually, the African-American man in the back is a park staff, so he helps them out with equipment and carrying their load of stuff. And they are ambassadors. So being able to have volunteers in a park is so wonderful because then people get to talk to you and you get to tell them not only about the roses but about the friends who are caring for the roses. I can't tell you how many people have stopped by to talk to these people and there are only visible volunteer presence in the parks. So when I talk about the strategic plan that we just finished, we're trying to think about what other ways can we both do the work that needs to be done, help the parks department with things that, there used to be 55 maintenance workers in the garden in the 19th century, there are four today. And that's remarkable. And the flowers look wonderful. Everyone always wants to thank us for the floral beds. The city has always done that. They grow them in their greenhouse in Franklin Park. They have a lot of pride. So again, it's important to give the credit to the city where it's due. Take it where it's due for you and know that you both have to do this together. The biggest capital project we have ever done, and we're in the final phases of it, and it was huge but worthwhile is the Brewer Plaza area. Do you, how many people know this area? It's by the Park Street Station? Yes, in, in Boston Common? All right. Well, that, stat, that uh, fountain in the middle, Brewer Fountain, was dry for many years. And we, have a, we don't have a great track record with fountains in Boston. <laughs> Minneapolis has a better track record. And it's colder out there. We just don't have a good track record. It's restoring it and it's maintaining it. So the city took the lead on restoring this fountain. It was a gift to, from Gardner Brewer to the city in 1867. And they put the, the, the lion's share of money and we put $90,000 in the, the uh, feds, the Save America's Treasures program put in $200,000. But then we also raised $300,000 for an endowment to care for it. We have a plumber coming every week during the season doing the inglorious stuff of just pulling stuff out that's getting clogged and draining it once a month to make sure that it's clean and, and functioning. It's a, it's a fussy fountain. But it's now what we said to the city is that if you just do the fountain and go away, we will not have reclaimed the space because this space was, this is what it looked like before um, its restoration. Over 20,000 people walk through this space every day. The Park Street Station is the fourth busiest station in the system and it had become a pretty entrenched place with homeless and people on the edge and there are a lot of people on the edge in the city and it's a, one of the issues we deal with in our urban places nationally is it's free, it's open, it's an open space for everybody. What do we do with people who are struggling? We have deinstitutionalized a generation of people that need the kind of support that they're not getting now. They're, they were in the Brewer Plaza area and nobody else was. You can see this couple walking through. Well our goal was to bring everybody here, not to displace these people, but to flood this area with positive activity so everyone could love it. And so this is a, a bird's eye. So the city was reluctant. What they wanted to do is just let us restore the fountain. It's been such a long time. They just didn't want to think about this bigger project. But we said, we will fund the project and we will fund its care and let's just go for it. So they, they said yes. So this is um, an image of it and this is a picture uh, this last summer, on a beautiful day, you cannot find a place to sit. So one of the inspirations, um, originally Holly White wrote a book about the social life of small urban spaces and, and um, Bryant Park in New York City kind of codified that and made it a, a huge success. And there's some basics. You need a place to sit, but you want to have a movable place to sit because maybe you don't want to be two people at the table, maybe you want to be four. You don't want to be sitting in this stationary. It's not bad to have benches, but you don't want to just have benches or just have curb spaces. You want to have um, some shade. You want to have food, good food. Uh, we have an amenity here of a reading room, so people get to um, books, magazines, and daily papers are there. And we have a piano. We have a, had a piano reconstructed, um, an old piano re renovated to have a high-end Roland keyboard in it and it's solar power, so we roll it out every day. And we have music from 12 to 2 and then jazz concerts on Thursday night. So this beautiful feeling, they're coming there, the fountain's going, the music is going. It's a place you want to be. So now it's one of the most popular outdoor places in the city and it used to be a place that people avoided. 
It does cost money. We run it at a deficit, but we're going to figure that part out too. So this last phase of the project is to restore the fence that was also missing along Tremont Street. It was taken down when the, the subway was put in uh, the turn of the 19th century. So we're just putting, if you go down this week, you will see these sections of fence being put in. And what that does is reclaim this park from the busy road to say, this is park, that's road. Um, it's just a wonderful space. Just one more uh, capital project I'll show you. So now we've become a more a robust enough organization. And again, we always have to, as friends groups, ask ourselves the question, what do we do? What does the city do? What should we expect the city to do? And what do we need to do because the city can't do it? Or what do we do and then for the quid pro quo say, well, we'll do this, but you need to you know, stand up for that or you need to take care of that. This 800 feet of Boylston Street edge of the garden has been a problem for a long time. Drainage issues, and we, you know, we're struggling with how to solve those drainage issues, and some planting issues that had overgrown its, its life that, from the 80s. It was designed, and, and the, the material was suffering uh, as a result. So we said, we'll take this one on because it needs to be done. And we had a lot of complaints from the neighbors who now, going back to those well-to-do neighbors across the street. <laughs> they felt entitled to have a front yard that was looking better than it was. And we felt that it was important for everybody that comes to the, to the garden to look better than it did. So we have um, done it. We're doing it in four phases. And we're learning a lot. And again, as a friends group, you can be more nimble than the city. The city has to take the lowest bid. The city has to work in its slow, inevitable bureaucratic process through a system. We can experiment within realm, and we always talk to the city. We work closely. We meet with them. They need to approve it. The Landmarks Commission needs to approve. There's a lot of layers that need to approve things before we do it. But then finally, we can, so for instance, with the um, Brewer Plaza, we decided that there were two contractors who were the best in the city that could do that job. We gave them the chance to, to bid on doing the job. We could have gotten some really horrible people who would have done it. And that's over the subway in some areas it's only four inches between the sidewalk and the top of the tunnel of the subway. <laughs> so we needed somebody really good to do the project. And this one, we looked at the history, evolution over time, and a planting plan. And again, some really interesting uh, technology, air spading to be able to transplant some fairly big material and move it and, and maintain most of the, the root zone and solving the drainage problem. It's just been a wonderful project. We did get some foundation funding and some funding from individuals. Um, and now we're up to the next generation of our life. For 41 years, we were led by an amazing, the founding president, the man who was talked into it in 1970, saying it won't be a lot of work. You could be the president. He said yes. He was a school teacher. Fast forward 41 years, he was the volunteer leader of this organization and an inspiring man, just a wonder. He's still with us as a, a, a guiding light, as a president emeritus, but we're, ne we're now in the last five years, I've been there for about five and a half years, I'm the second executive director, we're putting a foundation under that great idea with an office, with the staff, with um, planning, with a level of planning that we didn't do as much before and communication. And again, you need to let people know both on site and through social media that you exist and you're doing this good work. So we did our first ever strategic plan. Got, um, we did over 40 stakeholder interviews and thought a lot about how are these parks? So in the beginning, they're so much better than they were, those early images, but they can be better. I mean, as I said, the common is our problem child. The intensity of use that that park gets is unbelievable. Last year, there were 700 permitted events, 200 of which had over 10,000 people in it. And it's a 48-acre park. The use outweighs the care by an order of magnitude, even with the hundreds of thousands of dollars we put into it. So we, our mission is to preserve these three parks. Our vision is that they will be, as they are nationally important, that they will be havens of beauty, that they will be enhanced with sculpture, which they are, but, but well-tended sculpture, where people love it, and that they can, this last line, large and diverse groups of tending stewards. Going back to the Rose Brigade, can we export that idea in a way that is acceptable to the city, that we can do with modest um, skill, and get people more excited and attached to these places and to us? So, Again, building a strong and broad base of support is just key for your work. You just have to get the broadest number of people knowing who you are, what you're doing, why you need to exist, why you cannot go out of business. You've got to be here for the long term. These parks need you forever. 
and then the next two are about excellence. So the third, second one is partnering with the city to achieve excellence within all three of these parks. And the third one is about the common, because it is our, our public and act, active park. It is the most active park in the city. It is the most heavily used park in the city. And we need to advocate for it. So we're going to be doing a plan with the city and having a public conversation. What is What do we want from this central park? The fourth one is about a robust and well-run organization. You need to have your own internal governance bones, financial and governance to make this work. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but the, the first goal is about basis support because it's so important, about advocacy, and I think we heard earlier about the importance of advocacy and proactive, not just reacting and saying, don't do this and don't do that. Think about what you want for your parks and think about it proactively. A few minutes on a, another thing I'm involved in, which is Boston Park Advocates. I think I heard a little bit about that you are joining together. So as important as it is to have your individual friends groups, to have a network, to say we are all working at this together. So we do have, I'm on the steering committee of Boston Park Advocates. Um, this is a picture of the mayoral forum last year. 11 of the 12 candidates, there were a lot of candidates, showed up for this. And we had th 350 people come. It was the most heavily attended forum of voters in the entire, during the entire campaign season. And these guys took notice. They saw that we had people behind what we care about. It's not just, parks people are nice people. They don't yell and scream. And I'm not suggesting that you do, but you need to show with the numbers and with your passion, take that love and make it passionate, that this matters and it's important and it needs priority within the realm. Because of course crime and youth and, and jobs and there's so many important things that a city deals with, but we have to make sure that parks is not an amenity. It's not an amenity. It's an essential part of the fabric of a city. So what we did is we called on everybody in the city, all the friends groups. Now there's a lot of friends groups. There's just us in the beginning. Um, citizens uh, advisory committees, um, civic uh, associations, soccer teams, every, but parks connected groups. So we had 130 groups sign on to co-sponsor this this process, both with the mayoral candidacy and the city council. So these guys say, wow, there's a lot of people behind this. So how does that fit with you? And what does it mean to be a network? And what's important of that? You have to have a clear vision. We are now, as Boston Park Advocates, doing our own strategic planning, saying how can we sustain ourselves? Because meanwhile, four of us leaders are also leaders of other organizations, so how can we keep this ball rolling. Um, you need to have a clear vision. You need to make sure you speak for everybody and it needs to be simple. You know, what is a simple, you know, could be simply, we need 1% for parks. I mean, some simple campaign that can laser focus all those 130 groups. You need to have some structure, but not too much so that you don't start feeling like there's an in crowd and out crowd. We could talk a lot more about that, and I'm happy to take uh, questions. We're in the middle of this process of understanding, do we need to be a 501c3, or could we get, get by without it? We do need to have leadership. We need to pay someone to wake up in the morning and think about BPA, but does it have to be full time? So we, and we're talking to people elsewhere in the country to learn from their lessons of what they've done successfully on their own. And a lot of it has been around mayoral campaigns. In New York City it was, in Pittsburgh it was. A new leader, we have an opportunity to influence that person to, to get to know that green space is central to the success of a city. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liz. And um, we do, again, we're doing great on time. And so we certainly have time for questions. Um, so don't go anywhere. <laughs> so okay. I'm sure that we're going to have a lot of questions. Um, so anyone would like to start us off? And we can take questions for, for anybody, for Wolf or, and city staff as well. So feel free. Yes, Anne. Do you have a written partnership agreement with the city? That's a great question so, because me, yeah, so you don't for, have okay, a written partnership. Okay. We don't, and in the beginning, for many years, there was an interest on the friends part to be kind of fluid and open and available to do things that we thought we needed to, and wanted to do. I think we're now maturing to a point where we really should have a memorandum of agreement and really be clear, and there's a debate internally and with the Parks Department about what they do and what we do, but, I, but we're at that point of needing to do that. When, when you moved from your, your early days of fighting with the city and then became partners with the city, did that? Did you? Did you sense a period of uh, of, of uh, conflict over being cooperative and feeling that you had to hold back on the the advocacy issues that you would like to have been 
given, given full independence you would like to have been able to pursue? I don't think so. I think that we were, a lot of the advocacy was about development because these parks are downtown and there's so much development going around. It was as much struggling with developers and the Boston Redevelopment Authority as it was the Parks Department. Often we were on the same side with them about that. And you know, I think it's also about personalities because you know in your community there's some that are lightning rods for negativity and some that you just go with. Henry Lee, if nobody, you may not know him, but he's a, He's an amazing, inspiring person. That's our president emeritus. He had that velvet glove where you just would feel like you were knocked out and you didn't even know he had touched you. <laughs> we, when he retired, um, we put together a book of tributes and I asked the mayor and the city council and many people, parks department, sculptor conservatives, we got, I got flooded with letters of tribute to him, people that he actually fought. And the man who was the head of the Boston Redevelopment Authority was one of the most amazing quotes. So he said he had the job of trying to get Park Plaza built. And he, in the end, it was the shortest piece and the most pointy. He said, now that I live in Boston by the public garden, I thank Henry a thousand times for not letting me screw it up. Other questions? Yeah, well, what, uh, you, you talked about the decreasing, the benign neglect of the parks, and then there's this period where now you know, friends are involved, different there's partnerships, advocacy, a big mix of different things. How does that contrast with the notion that the, the city needs to be responsible for the parks? They need to have adequate funding because you made reference to that, and you yeah. obviously have to compensate for that. Yeah. You know, in 1634, everyone in Boston had to pay six shillings to buy the common, and in the 1860s, people paid to plant trees along the wall. So we would say it's always been a public-private partnership. So because people often say, I pay taxes, why do we need to have a friends group? Why do you guys exist? We should be, the city should be paying for that. The fact is, and the reality is that there's never going to be enough money, but the, but the, um, the art and the nuance is where do you draw that line? How do you leverage pressure? on the city government to get that money to the parks department where it should be while contributing what you contribute. Because I think the mayor and the new parks commissioner would love us. I mean, he jokes, he says, oh, just keep, keep the money coming, Liz, you know? And we banter about that, but we're debating right now in the budget process, should we take on the irrigation system on the mall? It doesn't work very well. You know, we found out how to open up the boxes and fiddle around with this so we can get it going because the grass needs to grow. Um, so sometimes we just get frustrated, like, just take it over. But again, it's this art of finding that balance. But I would say that there's never been purely city and not private contributions. It's just each community and each park needs to decide where that line is and how to use it for, for political advantage as well as the good of the park. Yeah. yeah. Just a quick one is about your financing and this funding that you mentioned that the market trying to compare it yeah. So your budget, your budget, is that, is that, is that from grants and donations and fundraisers? Or yeah. So um, we a number of different things. Majority comes from individuals. Actually, we don't get as much. We get foundation grants, but it's not as big as individual grants. About six years ago, we did a capital campaign, a six and a half million dollar capital campaign, and that was a moment when it was just before I came on board, where there was a realization we've got to solidify this thing. We have to really put this foundation under. Henry's not, you know, he's in his 90s and he's still the most vital man I know. It's incredible. We need to find the next generation. So we did get an infusion from that. It, we, we identified four major goals within that capital campaign. We also have um, funds for specific things. We raised money specifically for the Shaw Memorial in the 1980s, so we have a fund specifically for that. Uh, but again, in terms of the sources of money, the majority is individual. We have a big fundraiser in the spring where people pay a lot of money to go in fancy clothes. <laughs> and that, you know, raises close to $300,000 right there. Yeah. Yeah. I wondered if you ever supported a bond issue to uh, take on some of the projects that you tackled? You know, we haven't, but it's something that we could be talking about. It's something to be considering. I mean, there's some big things. We did a capital needs assessment of the garden and the common, and the common alone infrastructure is $22 million. So it, we have some big numbers up there we got to sort of confront. So it's something to consider for sure. Yeah. Yeah, um, I'm curious if you could just say a little bit more about the, the early days when you were fighting Park Plaza in the, in the 
one thing that I'm really interested in is that there's a really powerful argument for economic development in the form of buildings, whereas us parks people, we say, no, parks are economic development, and, and that tends to be a very weaker argument because they're business people, they have all these numbers of how much money they can generate, whereas Reed Lake can say, well, it's better quality of life and say kind of amorphous things the like that. Stuff, so, right. but it's, I'd like to know, get your ideas of like more powerful arguments in favor of the parks yeah. as, as economic. There has, there has been a number of studies written about the value, you know, quantifying the value of parks. So there is data out there. We had it easy back then because the development was so horrific. It was easy to fight it when people actually got a sense for what it was going to do. It's harder when it's incremental and you're fighting about square footage and I think part of the, in terms of, of protecting land, it's really important to know when you're, when you have to fight about shadows and and the other things that would damage a public space. But there is a lot written about it. And, and it, it's discouraging to us, I think, that we have to keep reiterating this story. It feels like it's a story that we know, but we have to keep saying it. And I think, doesn't TPL have some, some economic data on that and have some, some st studies? I mean, we've seen a lot of that out there, the economic value of open space. I and mean, we can quantify whether it's climate change, carbon sinks, and all the rest of it, or, or the, the, um, the value of the adjacent neighborhoods. I mean, that Greenway was clear that the values of those, of those adjacent properties jumped once that thing came online. And ours jumped. I mean, it's it's prime property now around the garden. But you can't assume that people know that. You just have to continue to articulate that. It's and again, if you have a big fight on your hand or a big like so, the Filene's building is so we have now shadow laws that protect both the garden and the common. And Filene's is finally getting a new building on its site. That building is going to shadow the common, but the developer angled it such that it's only got the shadow at the certain times of the year and the certain times of the day and the certain duration of that time of day that it doesn't violate the shadow bill. But, you know, when you're in an urban area and you've got development, we're in a development boom right now. I mean, there's a lot going on. There's some parks that are just going to get more shadow. We just know that. So it's, it's fighting that battle is hard. But you have to, there are, there are metrics out there that talk about and, and data that talk about quantifying the value of, of uh, new op urban open space next to development. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, do you have any oh. idea how the Boston spends on its parks and the percentage of its budget? The total, I, I don't have the number in me. And we've been actually trying to find out how much Boston spends on our parks, and they won't do that. And I know they could do that, but they don't want to do it because they also don't want to say, we spend this much more in your park than another park. But um, so we'd like to know because we'd like to know what percentage our contribution is to the whole picture. Right. Do you know how much it spends in parks in general? Parks in general, I don't have that in my head, but it is known. <laughs> I can get it for you, Diane. Um, so when the press group is raising money, you don't have a memorandum of understanding. You have a you know, the Boston Board of Trustees has said they don't have a memorandum of understanding. It never gets given to the city. Uh, and now and then, so actually we've bailed them out. So we have a park ranger program. It, we every year give $25,000 to that ranger program because it's so important to have park rangers. And every once in a while we've given money. The irrigation system broke down about three times in the garden and we contributed to their doing it. But for the most part, we do the work. The donors really want us to be in control of the money. And, and we want to be in control of the money. We want to do, and that's why we have to work very closely with the Parks Department. And depending on the personality, some of them could just say, just give us the money and we'll do the work. And we, our donors don't want that, and we don't want that, because again, we can hire good people, be nimble, but there's a lot of coordination as a result of it. But only, now and then, we have handed money over to them when they've needed it, but, but not as a rule. So you raise the money, and then you can still go through the process of, you know, for example, the historic park, you go to the historic preservation. 
Absolutely. We're doing a um, restoration of um, Daniel Chester French did this amazing uh, angel sculpture in the garden, if anybody knows it, it and it's casting thy bread upon the waters, but the waters have not been there since the 80s, so we're going to be putting the water back, but it's, we're raising $700,000 for that, 300 of which is going to be a maintenance endowment, but we are about to go to the Parks Department. I just got an email today, are you ready to come meet with us? Because we have our design team looking at the issues of the vault and whatnot. We have to spend a lot of time with the Parks Department because they're our main partner, and then we have to go to the Art Commission and the Landmarks Commission. I actually have a meeting tomorrow with the Landmarks Commission about something else. So we, we, get, we do a lot of um, meeting and dialoguing, and we don't do anything without approval. And the approval, it's gotten more um, bureaucratic over the time. They want now our license and our insurance. And, and the people that have worked in our parks have worked in them for decades, but there's a certain generation now in the Parks Department that's feeling a little more in control and concerned about, you know, not being in enough control about what we do, although we do tell them what we do and we agree, agree together about what needs to be done. Yeah. Other questions? Maybe we can, happy to answer or we can transition into a, the, next, the next chapter of the time. <laughs> Thank you. So thanks again, Liz, for sharing your experiences with the Friends of the Boston Public Garden. It's certainly a timely discussion for us as we undertake our efforts with the Trust for Public Land and Portland Trails, and uh, so we really appreciate you sharing your thoughts with us. And so that concludes a formal aspect of our program tonight, um, but we, have, we certainly have some more time. Uh, if people would like to spend a little more time networking, mingling, we have um, some partners have set up tables and displays, so um, staff will be here for a bit longer too, so we're happy to take any questions informally. And I really, really want to appreciate everybody for coming out tonight, and I want to thank again CTN for uh, taping the, the program so everyone in the public will have a bit the benefit of being able to watch it in the future. So once again, thank you for coming tonight. Thank you.